industry trends and best practices. Uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yesterday I had a presentation. This will be not horribly different because whatever I do in Moravia is basically talent management from a higher level. And this presentation is about the industry, how it's working. Obviously talent management is connected to it. Um, one side is the client and one side is of course the vendors who are actually doing the translations for Moravia. Agenda is from drop to drip, evolution of process, evolution of content, service, right sourcing, proximity, and finances. Uh, there are a couple of keywords here um, that are usually uttered quietly. Uh, right sourcing is not necessarily liked, but I will talk about it because it's very important. It is a trend in the industry that we need to follow up on. From drop to drip, this is how it used to be, and this is how it is. Clients came to us with a big project, and we said, well, yeah, we can deliver this in three months. Client was very happy. It was one big project, multi-languages involved, one big project, perhaps separated into milestones, but a very well-defined end date. We delivered the project, client is happy. Now the way it works is that there are small drops, many of them involve many languages, but perhaps different languages, different sets, and they say, well, we need this back in 24 hours. It's not like we have to evaluate if we can do it or not, this is a client requirement we need to adhere to. So we're experiencing smaller files. How small? Some of you, of course, know. Uh, very small. It can be 10 words, 20 words, 200 words, 500 words. 500 words is usually about a limit for 24 hours, actually. There's a requested. But um, would you imagine translating 10 words? Projects? How much time do you think it takes? An hour? 10 words for an hour? Well, thank you very much. That's the problem. There is no whole process attached to it. The thing is that transaction costs, they're prohibitive. The client will consider that 10 words is 10 words. Why would the client be paying more than what 10 words worth is? Right? How much time does it should they actually take to translate 10 words? An average. We're talking, let's say, 2,000 words of productivity per day. That's eight hours. This is a hourly 250 words. Hmm. Hmm? A couple of minutes. Thank you very much. That's how much we're talking about 10 words. The client expects it back in 24 hours, not 24 minutes. He actually could be expecting it back in 24 minutes, but this means that somebody needs to be sitting there at the computer, getting the file, transmitting, sending it back. And that's possible. We actually do that. We do that every day. There are people, it's, we're not doing a marketplace. It's not like we have a project, we announce it, whoever comes first can deliver the 10 words, please deliver it. Some other MLVs may be doing that, we don't. We actually have assigned resources. They're notified in advance that they should be expecting these drops. Oh, by the way, you may be expecting this drop on a Saturday. You may be expecting this drop on a Friday night at 11 p.m. Or at 2 a.m. for that matter. This is also a trend. Smaller files, quick turnaround, and of course more languages. Many more. We're talking 100 plus languages that Moravia is delivering. Our clients require 100 plus languages. They're entering global markets and not just the Western European markets, not just American markets, all of Americas and not just to China and to Japan and Arabic, but they actually go everywhere in the world. They go to Kyrgyzstan, they go to Tatarstan, they do. So I've been talking about transaction costs. The transaction cost of delivering 10 words, as has been just been said, is one hour. That's totally unacceptable. For one word, let's say I'm going to take my little pinky finger and say 10 words is Let's call it, let's call it, just for the simplicity, $10 cents per word. 10 words is in $1, right? How much do you actually charge per hour? Definitely not $1. Maybe 20, 30 times more than that, right? Well, the client will not be charging 20, 30 times more than that, obviously. They want to pay for 10 words. This is what Moravia has to deliver to the clients. We're facing this. There's a huge challenge in quality assurance. 
within one day you have to get, okay, 10 words, and somebody will need to take a look at the 10 words. Has it been translated correctly? Let's evaluate that. And it's not just a problem of 10 words being evaluated. In time, you need to find a second person who is available to do the job the same day, but you actually have 10 words. What's the context? One failing language impacts overall performance. This is talking from an MLV performance, obviously. Somebody in the back is nodding. Yes, this is what we're talking about. If it delivers 60 languages to your client, you have one that is failing, the client will say, hey, you're not a reliable MLV. Why are you working for us? Do you want to work for us? Please deliver on all of those languages. One exception is a big exception. This is where we are. Also, clients, when they do the quality assurance on their side, let's say they have a third-party vendor who's doing quality assurance, they're going to actually do it even on the 10 words, same way as we do internally. One fail is still a fail. The metrics from client side is simple. You have a number of projects. They're being evaluated. They count how many fails you have, how many passes, and they're going to say, well, your pass rate is 87%. Although that may actually mean that you only failed one 10-word project and altogether you delivered 10,000 words. It's still a fail. This is where we are now. Those 10 words is a single project and counts just as much as 10,000 words. The potato. The potato is something new. This is how it used to be. A project came, it was nice and square, right? It has edges, you can fit it well into your process because this is how the process goes. The processes are well defined. You get a square, the square moves on, a little modified, a little modified, a little modified, another square comes out that is the final product delivered to the client. This is where we are, Mr. Potato jumping into the screen again. It's slightly amorphic, it's very hard to touch, it's not so easy to handle, it doesn't fit into the process. What is this potato? This is the linguistic potato. The quality of source, the reference materials, the review process, these are all not well defined. You get 60, 70% of the information that you used to get, and you still need to be able to deliver what is expected by the client. And client's expectations haven't decreased, in fact, they are just increasing. So it's from fair to square to the linguistic potato. And of course, it's not just the process, it's also the content. It's not just the project is not squarish anymore. The content of the project is also changing. Well, the clients are definitely thinking about what needs to be translated. Yes, content is being generated exponentially. There's more and more content. But what is the client looking for? Value added. Which is the content that needs to be translated? And you say, well, what is the purpose of UA? User assistance, help files, documentation, user guide, being posted on the internet. Hey, I have a software, I delivered it to Kazakhstan, it's in Kazakh. I have posted on the website, here's the little, the usually the cogwheel icon, click on it, you can read help, support, whatever. Are you going to read it? You have an email provider. Most likely, all of you have a web-based internet provider, right? You go to the website, I'm sure that there's somewhere settings and there's somewhere help, customization, whatever. Have you ever read that? Well, clients start to wonder if you ever will. And they say, well, that UA content, is it actually adding value to the user experience? And they go out to their users and ask. Or they ask MLVs like Moravia, do you think it's reasonable? And we're going to say, well, we would love to be translating it for you because it's business for us, but ultimately we're going to say, to tell you the truth, the UI is much more important. And clients will agree. And they will drop the UA 50%, 80%, climb it back up when necessary, it is up to them. But it certainly will come with huge fluctuations. Also, from the standard user interface and user um, assistance files, we're getting more stuff from our vendor, uh, from our clients. We're getting marketing, we're getting trans creation projects. There's something totally different. For UI and UA, it's very visible, it's very simple, usually. They do require a style guide, you do have your glossary, you need to adhere to some references, there's an LK person somewhere who will say it's good or not. And then comes marketing stuff and trans creation. You actually need to adapt it to the country of the target. You need to think with those people's heads who will be using the product. Let it be hardware or software, doesn't matter. User-generated content is growing very much, both in size and in significance. Because ultimately, the time is coming when the content that is being displayed on the internet 
is not just widely available to anyone who reads English, but, well, the um, clients who are using the content that is put on the internet will want to communicate this to all around the world. How to actually make the user-generated content, which is a very bad quality source, available to the rest of the world? That's a huge challenge. Again, how do you evaluate that quality-wise? You have a bad source, are you going to have a bad target? That's impossible, right? And we're talking from projects to streams. Previously, we were getting these nice square handoffs. Now we're getting smaller projects that are just coming. And they may be following each other, actually, sentences, ultimately, in the website, but they don't come in one piece. They come separately. And there is, of course, evolution of services. The process is different, the content is different, but also the service that MLVs are providing to the clients, that the clients are requiring, are changing. They're saying, well, I don't care for this thing that you call TEP, translation editing proofing, I just want the quality that I, that I get back. And then, are you supposed to use machine translation or not? Well, many of the contracts, of course, that we have with the clients, or you may have with us, will say, no, no, empty is a no, no, please use human translations. And there are those clients who say, use machine translation, obviously. There are many clients in the world who already have their own machine translation systems, they will want you to use it. But then, please tell me how effective that machine translation is. It's new content. It is not so easy to measure. There was a whole workshop around it, I believe, today. But the individual vendors that Moravia works with, they will come with their own ideas. They're going to say, well, mm -mm. Um, actually, I think that, that, that um, MT is only 20% um, efficient. That's like a 20% fuzzy. What am I going to do with that? I have to retranslate the whole thing. But is the client's proprietary MT? And you say, no, 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 no. That's about the 70% fuzzy match. Think again. Time is a decisive factor. It is. Translate now or don't translate at all. No, thank you. I will not need the content because it's already outdated if you don't translate it by tomorrow. It will be irrelevant. It will not be needed. Nobody will read it. Quality is assumed. There are no more quality criteria as in, well, um, I deliver a better quality than the other one. There's no such thing. There is only one quality level and it's the client's requirement. Deliver that, nothing less. Anything else is unacceptable. Customer QA were over linguistic quality assessment. Yes, clients already go to their customers who buy their software, their hardware, who read the user assistance, and they will ask their opinion. And these people are not linguists, but they will give the feedback to the client and the client is just as customer-centric as Moravia is and as you are. And they will listen to their customers. And they will come back to linguists to tell the linguists that what they have done and what they have evaluated as 100% correct QA is actually not. It's a very bad translation. Let's align with the customer. And let's solve it. Right sourcing. Everybody does translation, you do editing, you do proofreading, you may do third-party QA, you may even do voiceover, you may do videos, you may translate, localize many things, but you may also want to do transcreation, user content editing, that is, collect the blog post and come up with a summary, a feeling of what has been said about the product, about a review, about a place, a restaurant even. On-site testing. Oh, please deliver me a person who can be here tomorrow morning, uh, 10 a.m. I am in Colorado. I'm your client. I need that person here tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Oh, please send the profile now, and this is your rate. This is happening. Can we deliver that? Yes, we can. It is not easy, because the client will want to see that person live, and the client will not give you a QA result of 93%, because there is no such a thing. Language moderation. There's a person who is asked to act as basically an outsourced freelancer who's working for Moravia, but is working for the client, co-working with the translation vendors, something that has been in-house with many clients before, but they're outsourcing it now. It is not LQA. It's something like community moderation. You put a person there and you believe that his or her opinion will be suitable to make sure that the product that is delivered to the customers is what is needed. And it will be successful, it will be global leader product. So, uh, translators, should they be actual users of the product that doesn't even exist yet? Should they be experts in the product? 
Yes, should they be IT experts? No, no, no. It's not that they need to be IT experts. They need to be experts of the product itself, that very specific product. Let it be a software, let it be a, mm, a mobile phone, let it be whatever device that needs localization. And yes, quality is not a good LQA result. The LQA result may be 95%, but then these previously the customer QA will come back and say, hey, 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 no, no, this is not the language that the people who use the product using. This is not even suitable, not even close. Proximity, this is what clients want. Well, this is what Moravia wants, right? I want it from, well, most of you sitting here. It is a people business. We need to know the people. We need to, need to know the individuals. We need to see their profiles. We need to be able to talk with them directly. I need to find out who's the person who's working on the files, who's working on the audio, who's doing the trans creation. Do we share the same ideas when he's dribbling, delivering community moderation tasks? The client will come to us and say, yes, send me the profile. Yes, send me his rates. And yes, send me his phone number. Because tomorrow I would like to talk to him. And if I approve, please onboard him. So named and client approved resources, again, this is a trend that Moravi is already doing every single day. There is a direct communication between the translator teams or language leads or language moderators and the client linguistic teams or even the content creators. That's how far it back it actually goes because the clients, this is how they think. Oh, um, I have a content that has been created. Good. That creation was definitely a value-added thing. Now it needs to be translated. It needs to go from me, uh, actually from the content creator, it needs to go to my translation team, the in-house, then needs to the MLV, then needs to go to the SLV, then needs to go to the little agency, then needs to go to the freelancer. And this is how far I am. And I still need to be directly connected to the actual content creators. That's very tough and very hard to manage. To make sure that there are the time zones, the language, the communication actually make it happen. What clients need is fast and efficient value chain and predictability and scalability. They need to know if the named resource that was contracted and approved by them is available or if he or she isn't, there's a second one or a third one. And it's very hard to find even one. Let's find many. But the client needs it. It's not Moravia who needs it. It's not you who will need it. Is the client. Oh, let's talk finances, of course. This is nothing new, right? This is a trend in the industry that's been going on. Yes, there is constant financial pressure on unit rates, let it be hourly, let it be per word, let it be per page. There are always volume discounts coming, there are always penalties coming, anything that affects actually the rates and the ultimate cost of the translation project. But the price is just not just per word, it's not just per hour. What is actually included in there? The translation only? Well, that's very hard to say, right? Because the client, what, it, what the client wants is that he gets the localized version. What we do with it in the meantime is many, many, many small steps. We're talking activities that are included in the price, they are extras. Oh, please have it reviewed by uh, local teams uh, located in the target country. Oh yes, first please locate those people who are able to do the customer QA. More evaluated services needed, Project management, who cares about it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, a big client somewhere, let's say in the west coast of the US, east coast of the US, doesn't matter. I don't care if you do project management or not. I want to have my delivery. And of course, it's automation that will have to help that MB, which is management by exceptions. It is our responsibility, our SLV's responsibilities, and it's our freelancer's responsibility to adhere to processes, automation, and tools, use them efficiently, so that 98% we don't need to touch anything. There is no project management. It's done, it's set. Log in, do, deliver. Other than that, there are 2% of exceptions. Does that sound ideal? Certainly does for the client. What are Moravia's priorities there for? And suggestions and our best practices. Automate whatever is predictable. Sounds good, right? Whatever is predictable, whatever is expected can be automated, more or less. Let's spend time on that that is unexpected. How about QA and how about quality checks? Internal, external, can that be actually automated? Sure, there are all sorts of tools, even right now in the market, commercial ones. Moravia is developing its internal quality check tools, right? Of course, can those be automated? 
it was just discussed in this room that how many false alarms those quality checks generate. Are we actually helping the process or are we generating more work? It's a very good question. There is, of course, traceability. We need to trace data. Everybody's doing that. Everybody knows numbers. These are my alcuate results. These are my revenues. These are my margins. These are my profits. Do you trace your people? Who's working on what he's working on? What was the original handoff? How it was delivered? Was it communicated well? Is the client satisfied with the communication? Is Moravia satisfied with the communication? Maybe the quality is actually very good, but the project teams will come back to me in vendor management to say, mm, this resource is delivering very good quality. We're very satisfied. They're always are available, but they're so rude. And say, okay, well, I will have to talk to them and give them another chance. Or, let's identify talents. It's brains, not heads, that matter. It's not the quantity, it's the quality that is assumed. Therefore, the quality of the people is also assumed. And of course, we need to ensure, oh, I missed out the talent. We need to ensure that there is value added. It looks like it's coming from, um, let's say, some deter detergent box, right? Well, it is. That's how value has been commoditized within the localization industry. We need that value to be there at every single step that is made. Any person who is touching the file has to add value. Otherwise, automate. Last slide. This is where we're heading, and this is where we would like you to come with us, because this is where the clients are heading and is taking Boravia. Achieving together. We need to listen to our customers. We need to understand their needs, even the unspoken ones. And we need to respond reliably and with diligence. And these all happy people dancing around, imagine a campfire. That's everyone. The end user, Moravia's client, Moravia, the SLV, the freelancer, everyone. Together. Thank you very much. Lazva, вы не могли бы попробовать просуммировать то, что вы сказали, и вывести три краткие рекомендации Бюро переводов России, которые работают на ниве локализации? Что они должны сделать, над чем работать? Топ три вещи. First of all, automate. Second of all, communicate. Um, I'm sure that all of you know the phrase, bad news early is good news. Clients know this. Moravia knows this. I hope that you also know that you know it because you have to. Tell us that there is an issue in advance. We will solve it. The client will also understand. Um, and the third one will be, be flexible. And I'm not talking time-wise. This is not an employment where I say, oh, please stay, stay till 10 p.m. because we still need to deliver and there's overtime that needs to be done. No, be flexible in your thinking. Be flexible in when you talk about quality results, when you talk about percentages, when you're talking about client expectations. Hey, у меня, у меня еще один вопрос. Как вы считаете, сейчас локализация, рост этого рынка еще продолжается или уже заканчивается? Имеет ли смысл активнее заниматься локализацией? Можно ли на этом будет заработать больше денег, чем на других сегментах? Certainly the localization industry is growing. Um, it is taking a different shape, of course. Uh, we're talking cloud-based solutions all over the place. It's been going on for decades. These are already being delivered to clients. And the clients are involving their customers more and more. And this is where the IT industry is most relevant for localizers, that the customers who are using the products are getting more and more involved in the actual localization process itself. Uh, что, какие сегменты интереснее всего? Это, как раньше было, ERP-системы, мобильные приложения, игры, облачные сервисы, железо, мобильные телефоны. Какие сегменты наиболее, наиболее, обладают наибольшим потенциалом? Well, certainly all these segments are still existing, right? Um, at the same time, yes, gaming is definitely an area that is exploding, especially online gaming, especially community gaming, community sites. 
Uh, we're also talking about mobile applications, which are so easy to deliver, but they're only delivered in one language usually. How to make sure that even the smallest apps can be localized. That's the challenge that is being considered right now in the industry. Но в каких из этих сегментов есть деньги? Кто будет платить? За мобильные приложения никто не хочет платить. Um, well, that's the question. We need to make sure that there is value added, and the customers are evaluating this, right? The end clients are thinking, which are the applications even on their own software is going to be localized? The same thing that is you can buy on your iPhone or your Android phone, the applications, which ones are going to be localized, that is up to the client to decide. It's a business decision. Хорошо, а как вы тогда можете прокомментировать ту тенденцию, что Многие крупные компании, возьмем, к примеру, Моравию или в России Янус Уэллблайт, сейчас постепенно мигрируют с локализации и именно вот специализации на, ниже, на этой нише в life sciences, в медицинский сектор. Um, that is not strictly connected to localization, even though with, even within the uh, medical sector there is localization, of course, of different uh, software uh, medical devices. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that's a much more, for example, life sciences is a much more regulated market. It provides kind of like a safe haven in the times of turbulence in the IT market. This is also why big localization companies such as Moravia is of course also looking into other domains as well. We do have the experience, we know that this, the experience from the IT segment can be helpful for the clients in life sciences as well. We know how to do agile localization for IT, we can help medical clients to deliver agile localization for their devices as well. Мы видим, что многие компании сейчас интересуются отраслью локализации и хотят зайти в этот сегмент. Насколько, как вы прогнозируете, насколько жесткой будет конкуренция в перспективе одного, двух лет, особенно по России? Я, насколько понимаю, вы хорошо знаете российский рынок локализации. Что можете сказать, вот, как активный его участник, покупатель? Насколько жесткая конкуренция сейчас, насколько жесткая она будет через полтора года? Um, the competition has always been tight. What is changing is that it's no more simply MLVs and MLVs being in the contest. There are other companies, for example, on-demand translation companies. Uh, you go to a website, you enter your text directly, you press a button, you see a quote, you press the button again, in five hours you get your translation back. We need to consider those, again, competition. For the simple reason is that quality is paramount for clients that, for example, Moravi is working for, but for many other clients, quality will be simply a matter of, well, I need to think if machine translation is good enough for me, or perhaps uh, a single translator with translation only is good enough for me, because I don't have more money. When we're talking about apps, they're going to go to on-demand translation sites or use a reasonably applied machine translation engine, and they're going to deliver decent, readable, perhaps, quality into their software. Will it be appreciated by the market? We will find out definitely in the next couple of years. Вопросы в зале? Два вопроса. Алексей, был вопрос, нет? Не был вопрос. Пожалуйста, коротко, наше время давно истекло. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. I think this question was asked for several times today already, but I need to know your personal experience about using CAD tools that automation you're speaking about. Uh, which CAD tools do you use in Moravia and how do they help you? Um, Moravia uses the CAD tools that are required by clients. This is the definitive answer. Of course, we're talking about basically all of them. Um, I, let's mention them anywhere from Trados, Pasolo, whatever you want. MemoQ, doesn't matter. Actually, there are some strategic CAD tools within Moravia that are being used. However, often, very often, um, clients have their own proprietary tools, which sometimes are very peculiar, as a matter of fact. Um, you will have to go to, a, um, no, they're very efficient as well sometimes. 
um, you will have to go to a very specific website and do an online translation. Or um, perhaps the client is even more uh, peculiar and is going to ask you to um, sign in through a VDI interface to a remote computer and use the tools that are installed there. You don't even have access to the tools directly. You will, of course, need to sign a separate NDA and make sure that you're in a closed, darkened room, no windows open, anything like that. Uh, and the last question, is there any other ways of, uh, of automation that you use except uh, CAD tools? But well, of course, Moravia is actually very strong in engineering and we have several um, tools that are being used in-house. Uh, they're not um, commercial tools, though. We're not offering these for sale. We're using them internally. Um, one of them, however, which is being used for free, as a matter of fact, for um, our vendors, is called Moravia Symphonia. And Moravia Symphonia has been launched, well, this week, I believe, officially. There's a press release on our website. And Moravia Symphonia is more or less a translation management tool. It's a little bit smarter than that and a little bit less than that. Uh, what it does is it's an excellent tracking tool, an internal system where project managers and vendor managers, such as myself and my team, can have hands off from process driven items and we can manage by exceptions. Thank you. Uh, Sergey from Acronis Company. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, customer QA uh, comes uh, over the linguistic QA. How does Moravia handle that? Are you actually involved in that process? Um, in some of the processes, yes. The customers will come to us and say, please locate the people who will actually um, test the product, give us their direct opinion on the localized version, and we will have to act on the feedback, even if the feedback is not released to us directly. The customer will organize it for us, and we at Moravia will have to feedback, of course, to translator teams. And it can be a long loop, but it's in no way a longer loop than the regular LQA process, for example, by third-party LQA. Okay, and uh, have you had such an experience with uh, Japanese translations? I'm not sure if I can actually <laughs> say this. Okay, and uh, the last question is, uh, could you please compare the pricing for microtranslation uh, stream uh, with uh, the large scale project? The pricing. Right. What oh, is easier to, to implement? What is uh, Murab cheaper? Murabia Murabia. pricing is the same as client pricing, practically. Uh, we're talking per port rates. There is no difference in volumes. This is where the market is heading. No matter what the volume is of the individual drip or drop, we're talking about the same word rates. Okay, thank you.